After World War II, governments had to rebuild war decimated economies. Leaders looked at the ideas of two prominent economists, John Maynard Keynes and Frederick von Hayek. These two schools of thought have shaped economic systems and dominated the economic landscape in the post-World War II era. These schools are distinct and clearly in opposition to each other. Keynesians advocate for proactive intervention. Government should borrow money to spend on such things as large-scale public works projects. Deficit spending in turn creates jobs, increasing consumers' purchasing power. Balancing budgets during economic slumps makes things worse, not better. The Keynesian School laid the basis for the field of macroeconomics. Keynesians are proponents of running budget deficits during recessions, but running surpluses during economic expansions. If deficits and surpluses stimulate or retard aggregate demand, they can be used to ensure full employment. In the fiscal policy videos, I pointed out several weaknesses of this approach. Deficit spending crowds out private investment if real rates of interest rise. Fiscal policy is usually too late because the recession is over by the time checks are in the mail. And deficits are impotent if taxpayers believe tax rates will eventually go up to pay off today's deficits. In addition, I know of no politician that would vote for increasing taxes and cutting spending during a robust economic expansion. If a majority of our politicians actually believed in this policy and committed political suicide by enacting it, constantly raising and lowering tax rates creates uncertainty because business cycles cannot be predicted precisely. Hence, businesses might decide to expand operations in countries that have chosen low permanent rates. Frederick von Hayek advocated for economic freedom, which is freedom from government intervention in the production and distribution of goods and services. Hayek viewed increased government intervention as a means of stripping economic freedom. He believed that when people are free to choose, the economy runs more efficiently. He argued the problem was that under central planning, there was no economic calculation, no way to make a rational decision to put this resource here or buy that good there because there was no price system to weigh the alternatives. He conceded that socialism shocked him and his generation, and that it told us that we had been looking for improvement in the wrong direction, meaning well-intentioned politicians or do-gooders typically promote and implement policies that were intended to improve our lives but fail because do-gooders do not understand the array of consequences arising from intervention. The thesis in his book, The Road to Serfdom, is just that. That is, government intervention leads to more intervention. Each intervention has unintended consequences, which distort markets. Unintended consequences of well-intentioned policy generates the need for more interventions, because consequences need to be corrected. It is this dynamic that leads society down the road to serfdom. For example, a major and often overlooked criticism he had of central bankers is that when they intervene to lower interest rates artificially, investment spending goes up because businesses and people finance projects they would have not undertaken had the intervention not taken place. This malinvestment results in thousands of empty luxury condominiums, stacked in vacant high rises in downtown San Diego, hundreds of ethanol-powered school buses being purchased by green Minnesota school districts, which must be idled 24 hours a day during cold winter days because ethanol gels in colder temperatures, or the construction of ethanol plants. The ethanol investment, or malinvestment, has several unintended consequences. More fossil fuels are burned in corn ethanol's production than the energy we get from manufacturing it. Soil erosion increases on millions of acres not previously sowed in corn. Increased surface and groundwater pollution 
resulting from increased use of pesticides and fertilizers, increased air pollution from ethanol production, depletion of the Ogallala aquifer at an unsustainable rate, raising taxes to offset subsidies for ethanol production, and rising food prices resulting from food being converted into fuel. I'm going to use two analogies to better demonstrate the differences between a Keynesian and a Hayakian. Potting a tree in a 10 gallon pot in the living room means a tree will only grow so tall because its roots are constrained. Now the tree has a really really good chance of survival if it is regularly watered and kept near a window on the sunny side of the house. Now compare that to a tree planted in the unrestrained backyard. Now the tree has a pretty good chance of surviving in the backyard provided it rains enough. There's a little uncertainty because for the most part Mother Nature determines how much rain your backyard receives. Now because its roots are not constrained by the pot, its potential for growth is huge. The tree could eventually be taller than your home. Planting the tree in a pot and restraining its roots is a Keynesian approach. Planting the tree in the backyard where the probability of failure is much higher is a Hackian approach. Western forest management provides another informative analogy. Nature uses small wildfires to clear out all the dead wood. This is creative destruction. It is this creative destruction that allows the forest to emerge as a stronger, more healthy forest. The Keynesian approach to managing the forest is currently being applied by the Forest Service. The Forest Service puts out all small wildfires. And when you combine this with an environmental policy that prevents loggers from logging these old, drying out forests that are accumulating dead wood, creates an environment very conducive to large, out of control wildfires. So Keynesians intervene in the short run. To steer the economy back to full employment, they pursue policies that close short run recessionary inflationary gaps. In other words, they put out the small fires that inhibit creative destruction. Hayekians are not concerned with short run fluctuations. They don't worry about putting out the small forest fires. Advocating instead for pro-growth, free market, not pro-business policies. We're going to use both diagrams depicted here to illustrate the fundamental difference between a Keynesian and a Hayekian. In both diagrams, the economy is currently in recession. At this red dot here, real GDP is less than full employment output. Over here, the red dot is below full employment output. The black curve here is full employment output. The red curve represents real GDP. Over here, real GDP is represented by this red dot and this vertical dashed line. Over time, notice what happens. The red dot in either diagram is hovering near full employment output. Full employment output, meanwhile, is increasing at a steady rate. Currently, we're in a deep recessionary gap. The red dot here is way below what it should be. The red dot here is way below what it should be. Rather than abandoning the free market to save the free market with the pro-business Keynesian approach that was used to fix the financial crisis and recover the economy, we could have maybe considered a Hayekian approach. Now the Keynesian approach that was started under Bush and continued under President Obama has put us on this bleak real GDP trajectory where economic growth is very slow and sluggish and unemployment remains high for the next three, four years. The Hayekian approach would have put us possibly on a better trajectory. The reason why I say this is because under the Hayekian approach, recession is allowed to do what it does best, clear out the deadwood. 
re deep recessions create the environment for creative destruction, where employees with outdated job skills lose their jobs and are faced with going back to college, going back to trade schools to get better skill sets. Poorly, re poorly managed firms, firms that made bad decisions during the recession, go out of business. So the owners of these companies learn from their failures and as a result come up with better ideas. Letting businesses fail creates unemployment. Now that doesn't seem like a very compassionate policy to promote or to adopt. However, in the long run, it's exactly the tough love the economy needs. Businesses that made poor decisions, owners of the businesses that made these poor decisions, need to lose their shirt. They need to go out of business. Combining the process of creative destruction caused by deep recessions with low competitive, stable, marginal tax rates on corporations and businesses, and strong property rights with a reduction in the regulatory burden that government places on small businesses is the Hayekian approach to managing an economy. The Keynesian approach yields a trajectory of GDP that is characterized by low economic growth and high unemployment. In contrast, the Hayekian approach is to make corporate tax rates and personal income tax rates as competitive as possible, strengthen property rights as much as possible, reduce as much as possible the regulatory burden on firms. And the more and more we do that, the more and more the black curve bends upward. So the essential difference between a Hayekian and a Keynesian, the Hayekians are concerned with the shape of the black curve. Keynesians are interested in closing these short-run gaps. The debate between Hayek and Keynes is humorously depicted in a video called Fear the Boom and the Bust. To watch the video, search Fear the Boom and the Bust in the YouTube search engine.